like to tell you about a patient of mine. Her name is uh, Martha Phillips, and I changed the name <laughs> for this occasion. But she's in her early 30s, and she, since she graduated from college, she gained about 30 pounds of weight. She's working as an accountant, and she, her typical day is sitting at the computer and staring at the screen. And so, like many of us are inclined to do, we're looking for an easy solution to fix our problem, right? In this case, she's trying to lose weight. And so, one of her co-workers told her that she lost 20 pounds, and she said, you know, I went on a low-carb diet. Well, Martha had read something about low carbs and how that they're um, really good for you. And so she decided, you know, I'm going to try the same type of diet like my friend. So she changed her diet. She eliminated potatoes. She got rid of the pasta. She got rid of the muffins, the breads, and the cereals. And she, on the other hand, she increased her meat to get more protein, and she increased her cheese, and she increased her fats, like salad dressings and other fats. And sure enough, um, she was losing weight, about 8 to 10 pounds a week, and she was very proud of herself. And so she decided, wow, I'm doing so great. Let me help this a little more. So she started eliminating uh, fruits and vegetables that had carbohydrates. And so after losing about 20 pounds, suddenly she started feeling s side effects that were not pleasant. And one of those, she felt tired all the time with, with this low-carb diet. She had trouble concentrating, and she was constipated. Sh her, she was working out at the gym, and her workouts became more difficult, so she couldn't last a long time with her workouts. And she also she felt she had no endurance. To make things worse, and I think that this was the frosting on the cake when her friend told her that she has very bad breath. Some kind of an odd breath is coming out of her. So is this low protein, low carb, high fiber diet good for people? We will talk a little later what I told her was the solution to her weight problem. But for now, we want to talk about the brain and how we can boost our brain power and improve our mood. There are some amazing facts about the brain. Our brain comprises only 2% of the total weight of the body, but it uses 15% of the total body's uh, metabolism. It has 100 billion nerve cells, and the nerve cell looks just like the one there on the right lower hand corner, and one neuron or one nerve cell can communicate with as many as 200,000 other neurons. So we truly have an amazing brain. And so we want to know what is the best type of energy for our brains. Is it fats? Is it carbohydrates? Or is it proteins, right? Well, the interesting thing is that while the rest of our body can use fats and proteins and carbohydrates for energy, the brain can only use carbohydrates or glucose, which is the smallest uh, type of sugar that you can get. And the brain has a very, very rapid metabolism. And so it needs minute to minute supplies of this glucose sugar. And you, this makes it easier to understand when you realize that the brain has seven and a half times the metabolic rate of other uh, body tissue. So the brain uh, has a very, very rapid metabolism. So it needs minute to minute supplies of blood, of this uh, glucose. And the other problem is that the brain, because it has a skull, and it has a very small storage area to store this uh, sugar, uh, sugar called glucose, it can only have a two-minute supply of this glucose on hand. If it runs out of glucose, then we're in trouble. So we want to find out what is the best food for our brain. Years ago, when they first found out that glucose or sugar is a good food, you know, people thought, oh, candy is an excellent type of food for our brain. However, we know 
different now. And studies have shown that large amounts of sugar in the diet have been demonstrated to impair the frontal lobe function in school-age children and also in adults. We know that for a fact. So sugar is not a good brain food. Children, especially if they have a high sugar diet, they have decreased thinking and intellectual functioning of their brain. How many mothers with school children do we have here? Raise your hand. Okay. We have a few. How would you like if you could, with a diet, transform a C student into a B student or a B student into an A student? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Okay, well, here's a study that was done with 45-year-old boys, and they found when they put them on a little low sugar diet uh, that they had superior, superior attention spans, they were more accurate in their responses than the boys with a high sugar diet. And the interesting thing about this study, this had nothing to do with their IQ, this had nothing to do with their parents' educational level, all it had to do with how much sugar they were getting in their diet. So the more sugar you give them, the less they're able to uh, concentrate and the less they're able to get accurate responses. And so when they tested these boys, by putting them on a low sugar diet, they were able to perform one letter grade higher. So instead of getting a B, they were able to get a C in that subject because they were on a low sugar diet. And that's an amazing effect just by changing the diet. So why does sugar impair our brain function? Well, let's look what happens when we eat sugar. Our bodies were created to eat whole plant foods, like all of these foods, okay, that we have on our table. Our bodies created to eat these whole grain fruits and vegetables and nuts and beans and peas and all the nice wheat and oats and bulgur wheat and so forth. That's what we're designed to eat. However, what happens when we eat sugary foods? Okay, these type of foods keep our blood sugar even. However, when we eat sugary foods like donuts and sweets and sodas, um, our blood sugar increases very dramatically and quickly. And then the pancreas responds by producing a large amount of insulin. And then if we have too much insulin um, and there is no food that... Um, drives our blood sugar too low. So the natural in, in increase in blood sugar is deceptive. Foods high in sugar are quickly absorbed and then there's a rapid increase in blood sugar. It goes quickly up and then it goes quickly down and then we're in trouble. Our blood sugar is lower. I don't know if you have felt that. If you have a sweet sugar snack and you feel good for a while, for 15 minutes, but then after you feel worse than before and then you start feeling shaky. Have you felt that? You start feeling shaky and you, f you can't concentrate and so then what do you do? You take another high sugar snack and you think, let me Maybe that'll make me feel better. And after doing that, that lasts for a few minutes, and then you're again very down and low in your blood sugar. The amazing thing that happens in our brain when we eat, when our blood sugar falls too low, whether we're diabetic or not, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Our frontal lobe does not have enough fuel, and so we feel lethargic, irritable, we may have difficulty learning new information. And so, like I said, we eat another high sugar snack. And after we eat a high sugar snack and our blood sugar is too low, it takes our brain 45 to 75 minutes to regain normal intellectual function. Just think about that. Three quarter an hour to an hour and a quarter by eating uh, a high sugar type of snack that increases the blood sugar quickly and then decreases it very rapidly. So that's why it's important to keep our blood sugar 
constant and even by eating healthy high fiber foods like we're showing here. So we will have energy, we will not have this um, impaired intellectual function. Can I ask a question? Yes. So what happens if I eat a fruit that has, say, has a lot of sugar versus eating a candy bar that may have the same amount of sugar? So what's the difference in the body? Okay, I think the next slide will answer that. There's a classic study that was done by Dr. Haber on the effect of eating three different type of foods, okay? He gave people either a whole apple, applesauce, or apple juice. And see, on the left hand is their blood sugar level, anywhere from 50 to 90 or 100. And then on the bottom, you have how many minutes after the meal, okay? All the three foods, the applesauce, the apple, and the apple juice had the same amount of calories. However, what is the difference? The whole apples kept the blood sugar steadier than drinking the apple juice. See how eating that apple, which is the first line, okay, it goes up quickly, but then it stays steady like it was when it started. It was like 70 milligrams and it finishes around the same, around 70. However, look at the apple juice, okay? The apple juice starts at 70, it goes up to 90, it shoots down to 50, and then it stays at around 58 or 60, okay? And this is the problem with apple juice. A lot of people like to drink apple juice or uh, orange juice for breakfast, but the problem with that is that it's stripped of all the fiber. So it gives you these quick, blood sugar ups and quick lows, which are not very good. It's okay if you eat it with other foods, but it's best to eat the whole food. And notice the applesauce. The applesauce is in between, and the applesauce kept the blood sugar around 60. So what makes the difference is the packaging. When you take an apple, it's packaged with all the fiber, it's packaged with all the vitamins and the minerals, and that slows things down, and that makes you feel good for a longer period of time. A molecule of sugar is made of two little units, glucose and fructose. So when you eat anything with sugar, you know, it gets rapidly, rapidly absorbed within minutes, okay? However, when you have complex carbohydrates like fruits and apples and cabbage and beans and pasta that's 100% whole wheat, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about 100% whole wheat. This is your white pasta here, dangling here, but this is your whole wheat pasta. You know how many chains of these same sugars are here? This is 200, okay? But the body makes thousands of these. So just think, in order for the pasta, whole wheat pasta that you're eating, or let's say you're eating some cabbage or some, a whole apple, all of these little units have to be broken one by one. That's why you feel full when you eat high fiber foods and complex carbohydrates, because there's all these um, little chains that have to be broken, thousands of them, okay? And this is only 200 of them. <laughs> So you can imagine how much time that takes. So a high fiber meal takes five to six hours to get digested versus if you have white pasta, white uh, bread, white rice, okay? So that's why I'm so big on whole wheats, okay? And sometimes people don't understand and even mom, you know, my kids sometimes say, you're so fanatic, but it's, when you understand these things, you can't do otherwise because like we said, the, the intestines are very long, and so you need another long chain. Of course, this is all tiny inside to break hundreds of these chemical bonds between the different uh, sugars, okay? Thank you very much, okay. So let's look at the importance of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates provide the body with the best energy for vital nutrition. They fuel our brain. That's the only fuel our body can t uh, take, our brain can take. We cannot take protein, we cannot take fats, but we need carbohydrates. And it spares protein. So when we have enough carbohydrates in our diet, then the proteins are spared 
to use uh, for building muscle and for growth and repair. And then it, it enhances the sweetness and flavor of our food and it regulates our blood sugar. So let's look at what happens when they refine wheat, when they make white bread instead of 100% whole wheat bread? What happens when they make uh, white pasta instead of 100% whole wheat pasta? Look, you're losing 86% of your thiamine, 70%, anywhere from 70 to 80 plus percent of your vitamins and your minerals. And then, you know, after they rob these minerals from our grains, what do they do? Then they enrich them. If somebody robbed you of $100 and gave you $4 back, would you feel enriched? <laughs> I don't think so. But that's what the food industry does to us, okay? And we think it's okay and we buy it. But we don't have to do that. We can buy nice whole wheat pastas. And you know what? A good way to start, if you're a person who doesn't like whole wheat, and maybe you won't if you're used to the white fluffy stuff, the thing to do is to mix them half-half, okay? You mix half white, half whole wheat, and you slowly wean yourself off of it until you just think it's wonderfully delicious and you think, how could I have eaten the other way at all, you know? So it's a matter, and, and we, we do that with children and they don't think anything of it. So it's very important to remember what happens here. See, they're stripping off 68% of our fiber, and some statistics give us even a greater amount. And then they're enriching with just four, but taking maybe 10 out. So now we want to look at complex carbohydrates and fiber foods they are a very good source of B vitamins. And B vitamins are very important for the brain. So when you go shopping, they have now these new stamps. Have you seen these on some of the products? Okay. Uh, if they give you that first stamp which says good source, then half a serving, it, it gives you only half a serving of whole grain. So that's a 50-50, okay? It's 50% white, 50% wheat, okay? So that's not the best source. I wouldn't purchase that if I want to be healthy and well. The next one they give you is excellent source, which is a full 16 gram serving of whole grains, okay? And then, um, yeah, the bottom one is the same thing. So the excellent source of 100% whole grain is what you want to get, 16 grams of whole grain. And they have that on pastas, they have that on breads, so it's a good little stamp to remember. Now let's talk about the vitamins. Vitamins are very, very important in our brain health, especially our nerve cells. The B vitamin, thiamine, B1, helps all cells, especially the nerve cells. It influences our mental attitude and helps create energy. So where do we find this? In whole grains, right? The ones that they just took from us, robbed us of. Wheat germ, peanuts, nutritional yeast, green peas, greens, oranges, and beans. What about vitamin B6? This is important for the functioning of ner nerve cells. Important for production of neurotransmitters and hormones. And what they have found out that people who are low on B6 uh, have problems with depression. So eating whole grains is good to prevent depression. Or if you have it, to lower it and get back to normal and minimize it. Okay, what about folic acid? Folic acid is important for growth and repair. And it's important for pregnant mothers and the baby. How many of you remember having to take folic acid when you're pregnant? Yes, definitely. What for? What is that important? Come on, some of you moms. Brain function. For brain function, that's right. Spinal cord, heart. Yes, yeah, spinal cord to make sure that there's no defects with the spinal cord. And, but now they're finding out that a folic acid 
works together with B12. And here are the sources, uh, nutritional yeast, dark green leafy vegetables, orange juice, avocados, beets, broccoli, wheat germ, bananas, Brussels sprouts, and whole grain bread, again. The, it's very important for seniors. Seniors, they have found, need this vitamin. And they have found that a folic acid deficiency can be a direct cause of depression. Dr. Nedley, in his research, has, and with his patients, has found that people who eat um, meat are especially um, have the problem with depression because this vitamin is low. So it's important to get enough uh, folic acid in your diet, and it's really easy to do if you look at where it's coming from. We have uh, chickpeas, which is your garbanzo beans. We have them here on our table. You can come and look at it. Have one cup has 1,114. And do you know what the um, RDA is for that? 400 only. So if you eat half a cup of garbanzo beans, you're getting more than your RDA. And then black-eyed cow peas, 1,000, also lentils, around 800, red kidney beans, about 700, okra has about 260, navy beans, 255, spinach, mustard greens, about hundreds, and even peanuts and orange juice have some. Steak, a uh, three and a half ounce of steak broiled has only 16 milligrams, micrograms. So it's very easy to get your folic acid in the diet, but you have to eat the right healthy foods, a nice variety. Okay, let's talk about B5. Vitamin B5 pantothenic acid, it's necessary for healthy nerves and it's used in forming red blood cells. The sources are avocado, soybeans, peanut butter, bananas, oranges, greens, potatoes, broccoli, brown rice. Again, there's our rice, brown, not white, cantaloupe, whole grain bread, and wheat germ. Now what about B12? B12 is very important for optimal brain function and prevention of depression. Now, Dr. Tucker of Tufts University, she advises healthy older people to take a daily B12 vitamin because after you get the age of 60, you just do not absorb through your, the vitamin you're getting in your food. And there are symptoms of deficiency such as poor coordination, frequent forgetfulness, and depression. And so, it's very important to have it tested when you get over 60 to make sure you're getting enough of it. However, we have to keep in mind that the sources of B12 are fortified plant foods and animal products. S many cereals have uh, B12 added to their cereals and many different foods. Uh, but they have found that both vegans, those who eat no meat, and meat eaters can have a deficiency. So we like to take a B12 supplement. That's advice, especially if you're in your 50s and 60s. And the best type of uh, product to take, it's called B12 Dots. I have a little sample for you to check. And it's one that you put under your tongue. It's called sublingual, so it just melts under your tongue because the digestion of it starts in your mouth. Okay, B12 dots by Twin Lab. That's the best source of B12. And it's amazing. I've had patients who have come to me and they eat very healthy diets, yet they have the symptoms of deficiency and when they're tested they have B12 levels that are low. You know, it used to be when our food was organically grow grown and when the soil was very rich in nutrients that you didn't need B12 supplements. But now the way things are, we just need to do this um, as insurance to make sure we don't get low levels. So in general, if we eat a healthy diet of a variety of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables, and beans, we don't have to have any supplements. The key is variety and whole grains. 
However, if you want to be sure, if you want to take one a day, but don't take m mega doses of vitamins because mega doses of vitamins are very dangerous to your health. They have a lot of side effects. And so it's best to get it in your food because the way they're packaged in the food, if you take too much, it will not harm your body. But if you take these mega doses, you know where they say 500% of vitamin A or 1,000% of vitamin C, it can be dangerous. Um, let's talk about um, sugar. Sugar. Con consumption data tell us that in 19... Yes. Um, Did you have a question? Yeah, the little vitamin B12 that you're talking about. Yes. It's one a day. Yeah, five micrograms. That's a good question. But this is more. I think this is maybe 50. Five micrograms a day. That's all you need. Yes. But it's good to take it, definitely. Okay. The average person in 1999 had about 158 pounds of sugar. Can you believe that? 158 pounds of sugar. That's a 30% increase from 1983. And in, 19, in 1816, you know how much sugar we were getting? 15 pounds a year. From 15 pounds to 158 pounds, and now we're 10 years later, so it's more, it's probably 170, 180, 2010. So what's wrong with sugar? We mentioned some of the things already. It's not a good brain food. Sugar has no vitamins and no minerals and no fiber. So every time you eat a sugar food, it has to rob the minerals and vitamins from some other foods so it gets digested, okay, like the B vitamins. And sugar, if you eat too much sugar, it takes too much place in your stomach. And therefore, it crowds out all the healthy foods. You know how it is when you eat a high sugar type of dessert? you know, like cake or ice cream and pie, you're not hungry for what's good and healthy. You kind of just are full to the limit. So it takes space. And sugar also hides in many different foods. And we're going to have some fun together looking at where it hides, in which foods, and how we can um, decrease that. Yes? What if we use that Splendor? Is that still the same? Well, Splenda is half uh, sugar and it's half of a um, artificial type of sweetener. Yes. So it's it's better. Way. It's better. But all the artificial sweeteners, they, if you read, you know, they have a lot of side effects. Mm -hmm. So it's best to have it in its natural form and to slowly re-educate uh, the you know, senses and the tongue, so we can enjoy things that are whole instead of eating the artificial type of foods. Well, the interesting thing is that we have to surrender our sweets because just a few, a month ago or so, the American Heart Association came up with this recommendation that women should limit their sugar to six teaspoons per day, six teaspoons per day, which is six times four, that's about 24 um, grams. And men to nine teaspoons a day times four, that's what? 36, teas um, 36 teas uh, grams per day. So we really have a long way to go. Right now, it's much, much more than that. Now. It's very tricky to find sugar because it comes under so many different names. I remember when I was in school in the 1980s, early 1980s, and there was maybe only like five or six names for sugar. Now look how long this list is. So if you look for sugar in an ingredient, you almost have to memorize the list and see, you know, how much sugar am I getting here because the the food people who are producing these products, they have divided the sugars and they don't tell you how much of each one it has. So agave nectar uh, is one and <coughs> it was claimed that this kind of a sugar from uh, the fruit agave, that it's better for blood sugar and, and if you're a diabetic you can have it, but it's not true. Brown sugar cane 
uh, crystals, cane sugar, corn syrup, dextrose, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, honey, lactose, malt syrup, maple syrup, molasses, raw or turbinado sugar, sucrose, evaporated cane sugar, juice, glucose, invert sugar, maltose, molasses, sucrose, sugar, syrup, and glucose. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So it's hiding under different names, so you need to know these labels. So when you go and you look at a product, if it has too many of these different types, you know you don't want to purchase that. You know, I really like to look at how science validates the Bible. And when I was in college, I had this class, it was called Special Topics, and where we were looking at some of these nutrition uh, scientific facts, and we were finding the answers in the Bible. So I just want to share that with you. You know, before the American Heart Association came up with their statement, the Bible tells us, have you found honey? Eat so much as is enough for you, or lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. So too much sugar, the Bible says, is no good, right? You can have some, but not too much. And then it is not good to eat much honey right? And honey is better than sugar. Honey has some vitamins and some minerals that sugar doesn't have, which it's much better for you, but it's still a sugar. And too much of honey is not good either. What about soda? How many teaspoons of sugar in a can of soda? Anybody has an idea? nine teaspoons of sugar in a can of soda and we drink about 49 gallons per person per year well I don't drink any someone's drinking mine so someone's getting more <laughs> and from 1985 to 97 our soda increase um, intake increased by 1200 percent now this is among school children okay and why do you think that happened soda machines at the schools and you know what happened at the same time the milk intake among those same children decreased by 30 percent and what is the problem with that we have young people especially girls who are at a time when it's very important for their bones to be strong they're growing and they're intake of uh, calcium is very low and so we're predisposing these young girls for osteoporosis later in life because they're not getting enough calcium they're getting all this um, soda and the phosphoric acid in soda leaches the calcium from your bones and besides of course we know all the other problems with sugar such as uh, Decreased calcium intake, in increased dental decay, overweight, obesity, decreased immunity, decreased intake of healthy foods. <coughs> and I was going to mention the average 12 to 19 year old drinks 2.3 cans of soda a day. Okay, now let's talk about a food that makes us feel good. We're going to talk about serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter or a, a brain messenger that is made from the food we eat. We cannot go to the store and buy a food or buy a supplement that has serotonin to make us feel good. However, um, this ser serotonin is very very important it helps us to be calm it improves our mood it lessens our depression and it's a good neurotransmitter that's very important for calmness for happiness for uh, lessening depression now serotonin is made from an amino acid ca called tryptophan now tryptophan is found in foods. So if we have enough tryptophan in our diet, then our brain can make more serotonin. This is very important. Now look at these foods that have tryptophan. 
you remember it was said in the past if you drink milk before you go to bed you will sleep good you're gonna be calm and relaxed remember people saying that there was research out on that well it's very interesting that 100 uh, grams of whole milk is only 46 uh, milligrams of tryptophan but there are other foods that are much higher in tryptophan it, which are mo much better for your serotonin levels increasing them such as black-eyed cowpeas, black walnuts, almonds, about three and a half, three ounces of almonds or walnuts would give you about 300 milligrams of tryptophan, or sesame seeds, gluten flour, pumpkin seeds have 578 milligrams of tryptophan, and tofu has 747. So if you want to feel good, you want to eat these foods that are high in tryptophan. They improve your moods, okay? And they prevent depression. Now the interesting thing that they have found, they did studies with people who have depression. And if they miss just one day of a moderate or high intake of these foods that are high in tryptophan, do you know what happened to them? They went into a relapse. So it's important to take these foods daily that are high in tryptophan and then you will boost your serotonin levels in the brain. So that's one of those feel good foods. And the beautiful thing about tofu, as you will see, uh, there's so many things you can make and later when we have cooking classes we would like to show you, you know, we make scrambled tofu instead of scrambled eggs. We make um, tofu cheesecake when we had our restaurant in uh, Los in, in the Southern California area, one of the favorite desserts people like to come for was tofu cheesecake. You know, because it has no cholesterol, it's low in fat, and it's delicious and it tastes good. So you can make cheesecake with it, you can make cream sauce, you can make um, kind of baked in the oven. One of the dishes on, on our last seminar day on the 4th we will have it's kind of like a baked chicken dish so uh, you can make patties out of it you can you know you can do different things with tofu you can make a pudding all kinds of things with tofu I know it has a bland flavor but it adapts to any kind of uh, seasoning you put into it whether it's sweet or salty So let's go back to my patient. Remember we were talking about my patient Martha at the beginning? And now let's talk about the benefits of a high carbohydrate, low protein diet. Okay, it reduces cortisol and that's a neurotransmitter that, that causes us to be stressed and depressed. So it reduces that bad type of a neurotransmitter, it fosters peak mental efficiency, it reduces our tendency to overeat and gain weight, and increases the brain levels of tryptophan. So when we eat these complex carbohydrates like this and a low protein diet, these are all the great benefits we can have. Now let me talk to you a little bit how we finished off with my friend Martha. She, as you remember, had problems with her moods and with her energy level and everything. Um, we explained to her that the most important fuel for her brain are the carbohydrates. All the foods she was cutting out were the best for her brain. That's why she was having the problem with concentration and she was not having energy and so forth. And um, she wasn't eating the B vitamins because she wasn't getting any whole grains. She wasn't, um, she was tired all the time because her body was breaking down the fat instead of carbohydrates. And when you break down the fats, it's called ketosis and that's what's causing her to have the bad breath in her mouth because she had no carbohydrates in her diet. And this is, you know, the famous diets like the Atkins diet and the South Beach diet, all these low uh, protein or high protein low carb diets and so um, 
the weight she was losing were, was mostly water, and so she was very dehydrated, and that made her also very tired. So she depleted her sugar stores, and that's why she couldn't exercise. When you exercise, you need carbohydrates to endure and exercise for a long time. And so we recommend that if she goes back and adds her grains, adds her fruits, adds her vegetables. And you know, within a week or so, she did that and to drink lots of water. And she was exercising about five days a week for 50 minutes. And she continued to lose weight, but she was losing only about two or three pounds a week, which is the normal weight to lose, you know two, three pounds a week, slowly, gradually, she was making changes. And the best part, she said, I feel so great. I have so much energy and I feel so good on the inside. You know, when somebody tells you, I feel so good and clean on the inside, you know, they're feeling wonderful. And the amazing thing is, you know, she, she had a family and it was around holiday time. So she said, I'll be good, but you know how it is. She went back and she had some of those same foods. She came home, she got sick because her body was used to eating the healthy, high fiber foods, drinking lots of water, and her body now couldn't switch back. She was feeling sick again, so she says, I quickly went back on my healthy lifestyle program and then she felt wonderful again. So it feels good when we see such quick results. You know, seven to ten days, if you start eating like that, you're going to feel a big difference. So let's review. What are we going to do this week? We're going to eat a healthy breakfast. That will give us energy for the day. That will help us not to have a mid-morning snack of donuts around 10 o'clock, donuts and coffee. It will keep us going from 8 in the morning to 1 o'clock. Lots of fiber, lots of whole grains. Right? And then we want to get enough water, at least 8 glasses a day. And the best way to know how much water is to take your weight divided by 2, and that will give you how many ounces, okay? So if you're 200 pounds divided by two, that's how much? A hundred, right? A hundred ounces of water divided by eight is about what? About 12, about 12 glasses of eight ounces for the day. Okay, so you want to exercise four to five times a week. The weather is beautiful. You can get out there, and even if you start with 15 minutes. Have any of you started exercising this week? Excellent. What are you all doing? You want to share with us? Um, it's just like a class. At the gym. A class. Excellent. Good. It's well, yes? Two miles a day. Two miles a day. Good for you. Wow. Okay. 30 minutes of treadmill. Good for you. You know, we live in an area where it's very hilly and to climb up those hills we walk two miles but you really get a double workout you know if you can just make it but if we continue doing this I'm thinking wow we're gonna be in such good shape because we're going to be you know really expanding our energy and our metabolism and we want to get seven to eight hours of sleep very important you know and so if you eat your evening meal around six or seven and nothing to eat after that, 